is made and we shall rejoice and be glad in it. We are certainly glad to have you with us today in our Bible study. We are thankful that the Lord has been keeping us and watching over us and giving us what we stand in need of. So we are, we are so grateful. So give me a minute here because I want to put my conference call on to 425-436-6343. Welcome and thank you for choosing free conference call So I'm putting my uh, conference call on so that we can, uh, those who are calling in, can also join in. you for your Thank indulgence. You. God bless you. This is Pastor Butler. Welcome to Queen's Chapel Bible Study and welcome to all of you to Queen's Chapel Bible Study. We are so thankful that you're able to join us again. Now, we have been in the first chapter of the book of Ruth. And this is an exciting book because uh, we're really looking at Ruth, who is the woman of character and courage. So we want you to get your Bibles, and we want you to turn to the book of Ruth. And we're going to look at the first chapter again. Last week, we looked at verses 1 through 13. Tonight, we're going to be finishing out the chapter, so we'll be looking at verses 14 through 22. So that's Ruth, the first chapter, verses 14 through 22. Now let's have a word of prayer together. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for allowing us to come together, Lord God, and to study your word. Your word tells us that we are to study to show ourselves approved. Workmen that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We thank you, Lord, that your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. So, Father, we pray that you would open our eyes, that we may behold wonderful things out of your word tonight. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now, last week, we, I, I want you to remind me of what we talked about last week, uh, that the entire book of Ruth has a theological uh, understream of redemption. It's a theological understream of redemption, even though it's a historical book, but it gives us also some theological redemption themes that is all throughout this book. And you're going to be hearing that as we finish out the first chapter of the book of Ruth, verses 14 through 22. So I hope you have your Bibles open. I'm going to be reading uh, from, the, uh, from the NIV, and uh, it should not be hard for you to follow me uh, if you have a King James or a New King James Version. Let's look at the 14th verse of Ruth, chapter 1. At this, they wept aloud again. Then Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. Now, where we're at in the story is that after um, uh, Ruth husband and Orpah's husband passed away and of course Naomi's uh, a husband passed away and now Naomi is, is, is now encouraging Ruth to now um, go back along with Orpah to their original country uh, to the place where they came from uh, so that um, um, uh, so, so, so that 
um, there will be at least a separation where, where Naomi is going to be going back to Bethlehem and Ruth is going to be going back to her home country along with Orpah. So uh, now in verse 14, we pick it up where they are now uh, getting ready to depart. And we're going to find out what Ruth, the decision that Ruth made. So look at 14 verse again. At this they wept aloud again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye. But Ruth clung to her. Now Ruth clinging to her mother-in-law was important. Uh, was very, very important. Because Ruth, uh, not leaving uh, Naomi's side was the determining factor for where Christ was to be born. I'll say it again. Ruth clinging to Naomi, clinging to her side, was the determining factor for where Christ would be born. Now remember now, Christ was born in Bethlehem. Naomi is on her way back to Bethlehem. Ruth clinging to Naomi is how Ruth ended up in Bethlehem. And years later is how Christ ended up being born in Bethlehem. So her clinging to Naomi, Ruth clinging to Naomi, is a determining factor in history that Christ would be born in Bethlehem. In fact, if you were write this scripture down in Luke the second chapter, fourth through the seventh verses, it says this, Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David. To be registered with Mary, he betrothed wife, or his betrothed wife, wife who was with child, so it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son, wrapped him in squatting clothes, and laid him in the manger because there was no room for them in the inn. All because Ruth clinged to Oprah, or, or Ruth, I'm sorry, Ruth clinged to, to Naomi and went with Naomi to her home country of Bethlehem is how Ruth ended there and how Christ was born there. Now, Joseph and Mary ended up in Bethlehem because Ruth claimed to Naomi. Let's look at the 15th verse of Roman of uh, Ruth, the first chapter of the 15th verse. Let's look at the 15th verse. Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods. Go back with her. So now Naomi is trying to get Ruth to go back um, with Orpah to their home country, to their gods, small g, gods, their idolatrous gods. Uh, uh, oh, oh, now, now, now her decision um, um, uh, is really uh, uh, a decision that had to be made here. And, and, and Orpah's decision to go back to her people was a decision to go back to idolatry. Remember, they were from an idol, idolatrous nation. And so her decision also was symbolic of rejecting the one true God because Naomi worshipped the one true God. And this is what drew Ruth to Naomi. This is what caused Ruth to really cling to Naomi because Ruth clinging to Naomi was, a, was symbolic of her also uh, connecting with the one true God. So Ruth decides to follow Naomi, but Opar decides to go back home to idolatry. Now Ruth's decision to follow Naomi was symbolic of her decision to follow the one true God, as we said before, regardless of the risk. This is why Ruth is truly a woman of character and courage because she knew she would be a foreigner among Jews. She's a Gentile. Ruth is a Gentile. And she knew she was going back to Bethlehem 
where the Jewish uh, nation or the Jewish people were, and she knew she would be an outcast. But regardless of the risk, Ruth still wanted to cling to Naomi. And she goes back with Naomi. In the same way, brothers and sisters, salvation is a decision one must make for themselves. For an example, the woman at the well decided for herself to follow Jesus Christ. Remember that? In John 4, where a Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? And Jesus uh, answered her, uh, if you knew the gift of God and who it was that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. And as they continue to conversate on in John 4, uh, uh, and, and Jesus says, but whosoever drinks the water, I will give them, will never thirst indeed. The water I will give them uh, will become in them a spring of water welling up into everlasting life. So the woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. And then uh, 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 she, uh, she discovered that the person who was talking to her was the Christ, the son of the living God. And she left her water jars, left her water pots, and the woman went back to the town and said to the people, come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Uh, uh, could this be the Messiah? And they came out to the town and made their way towards him. This woman at the well made a decision for salvation. When a person uh, wants to give their life to Jesus Christ, there has to be a decision. There has to be a decision that was made. The same decision that Ruth made is the same decision that everybody had to make. If you're saved today, you are blessed. But before you were saved, when you heard the gospel, you made a decision to follow Jesus Christ. Here's another example. Mary Magdalene. Joanna, Suanna decided to follow Jesus Christ. In fact, Luke 8, 1 through 3 tells us this. Luke 8, 1 through 3 tells us this. Now it came to pass, after that he went through every city and village preaching and bringing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God, and the twelve were with him. And certain women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities. It was Mary, called Magdalene, out of whom had come seven demons, and Joanna, the wife of Cusa, um, Herod, Stuart, and Suanna, and many others who provided for him from their substance. All these women, Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Suanna, all of them made a decision to follow Jesus Christ, all three of them. Some readers make the mistake that Mary Magdalene uh, uh, was the prostitute who washed the disciple or who washed Jesus' feet with her hair, but, uh, but there's no proof of that. So that was another woman who also came and made a decision to follow Jesus Christ. So what am I saying here? Salvation, brothers and sisters, is a choice. It's a choice. It's nothing forced on you. It's a choice. That's why Joshua 24, 15 tells us this. And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourself this day whom you will serve. All right? So, uh, so, if, so salvation is a choice. And this is what Ruth did. Ruth made a choice to follow um, uh, Naomi to Bethlehem because she wanted to connect with the God that Naomi worshipped. Now let's go to the 16th verse of Ruth 1. But Ruth replied, Don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. 
Your people will be my people, and your God, my God. So Ruth made a very important decision, and her decision was symbolic, watch this now, her decision was, was symbolic of repentance. 2 Corinthians 7 and 10 tells us this. This is Paul speaking in 2 Corinthians 7 and 10. For godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation, not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. So when, when Paul said godly sorrow, godly sorrow refers to sorrow that is according to the will of God. In other words, it's, it's, it's God who is sovereign. God who is sovereign, who, who, who's, whose grace, uh, that provenient grace that, uh, uh, that, that, that uh, now is a significant factor in us making the decision for Jesus Christ. Because true repentance cannot occur apart from genuine sorrow over one's sinful condition. That's all in prevenient grace. Prevenient grace helps us to, to realize that I am a sinful person, that I need to make a decision for Jesus Christ. Repentance, remember this, brothers and sisters, repentance is at the heart of salvation. You cannot have salvation without repentance. You cannot have repentance and not obtain salvation. Repentance means to turn. It means a change of mind from wrong to right. That's part of the, uh, the prevenient grace process. Is that during that time of repentance, I am changing my, my mind. I was heading towards sinfulness. I was heading towards a road of destruction. But now I changed my mind. I'm looking for a way in which I can make a U-turn. Like you're driving and you discover that you're going the wrong way or the GPS says, please make the next legal U-turn. Well, that's what repentance is. Repentance is realizing that I am a sinner and I need to change my mind about my spiritual condition. And I need to make a, a U-turn away from evil, away from sin, back towards God. Well, Ruth probably, after learning about the goodness of the Lord from Naomi, did not want to go back to idolatry. So she repented from that and was willing to go with Naomi to serve the same God that Naomi was serving. Ruth pleaded with Naomi. She said, where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. My brothers and sisters, that's nothing more than repentance. That she is turning her back towards her idolatrous nation. And now she's willing to come out of that and to serve the one true God. Now let's go to the 17th verse. This is, this is really good stuff. Where you die, I will die. This is Ruth talking to Naomi. Where you die, I will die. And, and, and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. Now, now when repentance takes place in a person's life through the prevenient grace. Repentance brings a willingness to die to self. Let me say that again. Repentance brings a willingness to die to self. Your, your desire not to sin anymore. Your desire not to travel in the same direction in which you were going, now you have changed your mind. Because we break, because repentance brings a willingness. Remember that word willingness. It's a willingness. I have a willingness within me that I want to die to that which was causing me to go in the wrong direction. 
That means one must be willing to put to death what is not like Christ. I need to say that again. That means one must be willing to put to death what is not like Christ. Let's look at Ephesians, the fourth chapter, verses 22 through 24. Ephesians 4, verses 22 through 24. Follow me right there. And it says that you put off concerning the former conduct, the old man, which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust. You see what Paul is saying here? It's, it's, it's all about dying in the self. So when you die to self, the 22nd verse says that you put off. In other words, you're actually pulling off. You're actually turning your back on. You're actually stopped moving in that direction in which you were moving. And now you're willing to allow the power of the Holy Spirit to do the work of sanctification. Do the work of sanctification. Now I am willing to pull off. In other words, I'm willing to stop doing what I used to do. It says that you pull off concerning your former conduct. That old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust. The deceitful lust. It was a lust within me. It was a desire within me. To go after the, 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 the conduct that was not pleasing in God's sight. But now, through the sanctifying grace of God, I am now able to now pull off that old person. To now change my conduct. Alright? And, 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 and when we change our conduct, that means that we have different or, 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 or we have uh, 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 nothing but the pure word of God now uh, coming into our hearts, into our minds. And look at the 23rd verse. And it says, be renewed in the spirit of your mind. That's what I mean here. Be renewed in the spirit of our mind. If, if I'm going to pull off the old person, if I'm going to now have a new conduct, if I'm going to now get rid of that old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust, then I have to be renewed in the spirit of my mind. And that, and look at verse 24, and that you put on the new man which was created according to God and true righteousness and holiness. So that means that there needs to be a word from the Lord. You need to get into the word of God. The reason why you're not able to stop doing what you're doing. Even though you have said those words, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And even though you said, Lord, I want to stop doing what I'm doing. And, and even though you believe that he died on the cross and that on the third day he rose from the dead, but yet you don't see any change, is because now you have to take it upon yourself to get into the word of God, to pray and ask the Lord, Lord, please renew the spirit of my mind through the word of God. That's why the word becomes a lamp unto your feet and a light unto your path. That's why... Paul said in, uh, in, 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 in his uh, book that he wrote in Romans, the 12th chapter, he says that, uh, that we are to present our bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable unto him, which is our reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our mind. So in order to renew our minds, we must get into the word of God. 2 Corinthians 5.17 tells us this. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. How do they become new? Because the word of God contains the spirit of God. The word of God contains the power in which we can transform our thinking, in which we can now stop doing the things that we used to do. And we do not, listen, we do not have the power 
to speak to ourselves on this. A lot of people tell themselves, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do that. And what do they end up doing? The very thing that they say they're not going to do. But you need the word of God in your life to help you to be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Now let's go, go to the uh, 18th verse in Ruth, the first chapter. Look at the 18th verse. When Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her. Now mark that word determined. She was determined to go with her. She stopped urging her to go the other way. She saw this determination. If, if, if you can go with me as I imagine this, as, as, as Naomi was looking at Ruth, and she was probably trying to push her away from her, but yet Ruth kept clinging to her. And so I believe that Naomi probably looked into the eyes of Ruth and saw determination. That's why when salvation, listen, if you want to change your life, you got to be determined. You got to be, you can't play with this thing. Because I'm going to tell you something. Satan has a hold, listen, he, when, when he has a hold on you, I'm going to tell you something. According to John 10.10, 10, Satan comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. So when Satan gets a hold of people, that's what he wants to do. He wants to steal, he wants to kill, he wants to destroy. But Jesus says, hallelujah, I come that you may have life and that more abundantly. But you got to be determined. You got to be determined within yourself that I am not going to go back that way again. You got to determine within yourself, I'm going to take time to read the word of God. You got to determine within yourself that I am going to, I'm going to cut out in my uh, uh, schedule here time to pray as I read the word of God. You got to study the word of God. You listen, you you got to ask the Lord. Lord, I ask that the power of your Holy Spirit would transform my life and you will give me whatever I stand in need of for each day that I read your word. You got to be determined. Determined. Say that word. Determined. Yeah. She was determined. The only realized that Ruth was determined to go back with her. And so what happened? Naomi stopped urging her. Naomi stopped urging her. Ruth was determined. She decided within her heart to follow her mother-in-law. Listen, when, when, when she decided to follow her mother-in-law, as I said before, it was symbolic of her making the decision to follow God. The disciples also had the same mind when they were introduced to Jesus Christ in John, the first chapter, verses 35 through 42. John 1, 35 through 42. This is what happened. The following day, John was again standing with the two of his disciples. This was John the Baptist standing with two of his disciples. As Jesus walked by, John the Baptist looked at him and declared, Look, there is the Lamb of God. And when John's two disciples heard this, they followed Jesus. Jesus looked around and saw them following. And he says to them, What do you want? He asked them. They replied, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? And he said, Come and see, he said. It was about 4 o'clock in the afternoon when they went with him to the place where he was staying. And they remained with him the rest of the day. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of these men who heard what John said and then followed Jesus. Andrew went to find his brother Simon and told Simon, which was Peter, and, 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 and he's, he said, we have found the Messiah, which means the Christ. 
verse 42 tells us, then Andrew brought Simon to meet Jesus, looking and, and, and looking intently at Simon, Jesus said, your name is Simon, son of, son of John, but you will be called Cephas, which means Peter. In other words, these, these disciples decided to follow Jesus because they had a determination. They had something within them that they saw in Christ that they wanted to connect with. They had a determination because they could have went all different kinds of directions. They could have went with the Sadducees, the Pharisees. I mean, they could have went in any direction, but they saw Jesus all because John pointed Jesus out. This is the Christ. This is the Lamb of God. So they were determined. And because of John the Baptist testimony, uh, John, Andrew, Simon Peter followed Jesus. Because, listen, because of Naomi's witness of God Almighty, Ruth followed her. Listen to me very carefully. Because of Naomi's witness of God in her life, Ruth followed Naomi. I'll say it again. Because of Naomi's witness of God in her life, Ruth followed Naomi. Now, here's the question that you and I need to think about. If you were the only model of Christianity in your community, in the world in which you live, how many people would follow Jesus Christ because of you? That's the question we need to ask ourselves. Is our life exemplifying Christ? If you were the only model of Christianity, if you were the only representation of God. How many people will want to follow Christ? How many people will want to follow God? If, if, if you were arrested for being a born-again believer, would there be enough evidence to convict you? This is, this, is, this is some poignant questions that I'm just not throwing out at you, but I'm, I'm, I'm asking myself as well. Am I a representation of Christ that when somebody comes to speak to me, will they see Christ in me, how I'm speaking, how I'm carrying myself? Would they walk away and say, wow, there's something about that person that I want? Hmm. Because that is the question here. Because listen, listen very carefully. Listen very carefully. Jesus Christ would not have been born in Bethlehem if it had not been for Naomi. Naomi was a witness for God. And Ruth, who worshipped idolatry, she was in idolatry, brothers and sisters. But now what she saw in Naomi, it caused her to come out of idolatry and now to follow Jesus Christ. If you were the only model of God, if you were the only model of Christianity, how many people would follow Jesus Christ? Let's look at the 19th verse. So the two women went on until they came to Bethlehem. When they arrived in Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the women explained, or they exclaimed, can this be Naomi? Is this male, is this the same woman that we saw leave a long time ago and now she's back? Is this really Naomi? Now, how come did they ask that question? Of course it was Naomi. But why did they ask that question? Well, the well, the family, listen, Naomi's family that had left a long time ago, they saw a husband. They saw a wife. They saw two children leave. But now Naomi is coming back. She has no husband. Her children, they're gone. All three are dead. And the only person she has with her is a little foreign girl named Ruth from 
Moab of all places. Now, now Naomi's name means pleasantness and delightful. So as Naomi is coming into town, she is not pleasant, nor is she delightful. She is now coming into town sad because she had all this death in her family. And she has this foreign girl who is with her. In fact, verse 19 says, the whole town was stirred because of them, and the women exclaimed, can this be Naomi? In other words, is this the same person? What happened to her? What, what, what transpired in her life that will cause her not to be this pleasant person we used to know? Where's your husband? What happened to your children? What's going on in your life? Let's look at uh, verses 20 through 22. And Naomi explains why she is no longer living up to what her name means, pleasant and delightful. Look at verses 20, 21, and 22. She said, don't call me Naomi, she told them. Call me Myrrah, because the Almighty has made my life bitter. So she says, instead of calling me pleasant, and delightful, call me bitter. So as she came back into Bethlehem, she was bitter. She was, she was not this pleasant person that they saw years ago. Look at verse 21. I, I went away full. In other words, I went away happy. I went away with a full family. But the Lord has brought me back empty. Oh my goodness. She said, I went away full. I went away happy, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me pleasant and delightful? In other words, why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. So Naomi returned from Moab accompanied by Ruth, the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, arriving in Bethlehem as the barley harvest was beginning. People didn't know what to do. People said, wow, what's, what's going on here? So, so, so as she is explaining to them that you need to now call me bitter because of what the Lord allowed to happen to me. That's what she is saying. She says, call me bitter because of what the Lord has brought upon me. Call me bitter for what the Lord allowed to happen to me. Call me bitter because now I've been afflicted according to God's will in my life. Wow. Now that's, that's heavy. Because usually you and I, when we give our lives to the Lord Jesus Christ, we expect to have this God of joy, this God of peace, this God of love. We don't expect to experience the God of anger, the God of, of, uh, of, uh, of bitterness, uh, the, uh, the God of emptiness. We don't expect to experience a God like that. What is God doing in my life? Why is my life going in the direction in which it's going, even though I'm in the will of God? Remember when the disciples was on the water and Jesus was in the boat and Jesus told his disciples, let's go to the other side of the sea? You heard me give this direction. You heard me give this example many times. And when they started out, there was a storm. They were in the perfect will of God, but there was a storm that came upon them. And the storm was as if it was going to take their lives. But the Lord God, when, when he woke up and he rebuked the storm and he told his disciples, Oh, ye of little faith, why were you afraid? In other words, see, when we go through these problems and situations in our lives, Especially as we're going through this pandemic. We don't know why the Lord is allowing to happen 
what's taking place in our lives. Why now? Why this pandemic now? I was doing so well in school. Why this pandemic now? I just landed the job that I always wanted. Why this pandemic now? I just got a raise on my job, and now I'm able to get the house that I want. But why this pandemic now? Why this pandemic now? Now I'm laid off of my job. Now I gotta find another job. Why this pandemic? Why this pan? I lost somebody in my life to COVID nineteen. Why this pandemic? In my why God? Naomi said, "Don't call me pleasantness. Don't call me delightful. Call me bitter." Because God has allowed this stuff to happen in my life and I don't have an explanation for it. Even though the people say, wow, what happened to Naomi? I can't believe it's you. What's going on? You left happy, now you're back and you're sad, you're bitter. And Naomi said, I don't have no explanation for you for why God allowed it to happen. All I know is that it happened. Naomi's outlook on life was not hopeful because she was bitter about life. She said in verse 21, I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. I went away full, and the Lord has brought me back empty. Many believers today really, really think that sometimes God is mad at them. People really think that maybe God is against them. People sometimes think that because of this and because of that, God is doing this to me. You know? And, and when we know that we serve a loving God, we serve a God that understands us uh, from the crown of our head to the sole of our feet, and he knows, listen, God knows what is good for us. But what happened to Naomi? Listen to me very careful. What happened to Naomi was under God's sovereign will. What happened to Naomi was under God's sovereign will. I'll say it again. What happened to Naomi was under God's sovereign will. See, many believers do not fully understand God's sovereignty. They really don't understand God's sovereignty. But God's sovereignty is not only seen in this book of Ruth, but is also seen in the book of Esther. God's sovereignty. God is allowing certain things to happen because he knows what's going to happen down the road. I, don't, I, I can't tell you why this pandemic is upon us. We can point to China, we can point to this, we can point to that, but we don't know why God allowed this to happen, why churches are now shut down, why businesses are, are now have gone out of business, and, 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 and why this is happening in our school system and, and places of employment has really bottomed up. I mean, we don't know why God is allowing this to happen, but God has a end product. He knows what he wants to happen down the road. And many believers do not fully understand God's sovereignty. Let's talk a little bit as we get ready to end here. Let's, 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 let's talk a little bit about God's sovereignty. See, God's sovereignty essentially means that he has the power. God has the wisdom. And God has the authority to do anything he chooses within his creation to bring about his will. Let me say that again. God's sovereignty essentially means that he has the power, he has the wisdom, he has the authority to do anything he chooses within his creation to bring about his will. God's will, listen now. God's will was to have Jesus Christ to be born in Bethlehem. But what happened to Naomi had to happen in order to bring about that will. 
God's sovereignty is one of the most important principles in Christian theology. However, it is also one of the most hotly debated subjects in Christianity. Because, see, a lot of times when we give our lives to Jesus Christ, we want to design God to be what we want God to be. But God is not going to change because of what we feel God should be. See, God's sovereignty is his omniscience, which is all-knowing. God's sovereignty is his uh, omnipotence, which is his power. And God's sovereignty is God's omnipresence. God is everywhere. That is, when we look at God's sovereignty, God is all-knowing. He knows the future. He knows, his, he knows the will that he has for our lives. He, he is all powerful. He can move mountains. He can move situations. He can, he can allow things to happen and cause things to happen. And he's omnipresent. God is everywhere. If you are a child of God like I am a child of God, and if we're going through these storms of life, we must understand that God is with us. He's everywhere. God will not allow you. Listen, God will, God will have his hand upon you because he's going to be guiding you. He's going to be directing you. So the point that many believers uh, have a problem in really grasping is that God's sovereignty means that everything that happens is, at the very least, the result of God's permissive will. That's the problem. Let me say it again. God's sovereignty means that everything that happens is, at the very least, the result of God's purposive will. The right of God to allow mankind's free choice is just as necessary for true sovereignty. Remember that. The right of God to allow mankind's free choice is just as necessary for true sovereignty. In other words, true sovereignty can also come through with God allowing us to make decisions that affect our lives. And his sovereignty is also seen in his ability to enact his will. Whatever and however he chooses, God is sovereign. For an example, God allows people to suffer so they will turn to him in repentance and not perish for eternity. God allows certain things to happen based upon our decisions that we made in our lives to allow us to grow from it, to realize that, yes, we made a mistake, but we need to, to correct it and get on the right path. That's part of God's sorrow. God is sovereign. Uh, uh, in fact, let me give you a couple of scriptures that point to this. And I know what I'm saying here. Listen, I know what I'm saying. I'm saying some, 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 some things here. And I wish you were in this room with me because I'm sure you have some questions. And I may not be able to answer all those questions. But God's sovereignty is one of those hot subjects that, uh, that, that people have their thoughts, their own thoughts on it. But I'm just giving you the basic, fundamental, uh, theological concepts of what sovereignty is. And, and let me give you a couple scriptures here. Because, be, 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 because when it comes to God's sovereignty, when it comes to God's sovereignty, this is what I want to say to you. When it comes to God's sovereignty, God requires that you and I trust him. God's sovereignty requires that you and I trust God for what he allows in our lives. Sometimes it's painful. Sometimes we don't understand. Sometimes we think God does not love us. Sometimes we think God is punishing us. 
Sometimes we're, 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 we, are, we are suffering from the consequences of our behavior and our choices in life. And we're wondering now that we're on the Lord's side, how come God is not easing our pain? How come I still feel bitter? We have to trust God for what God allows. Let me give you a couple scriptures here as we get ready to end. Isaiah 45 Verses 7 through 9. Isaiah 45, verses 7 through 9. This is the word. This is not Reverend Butler. This is the word. Listen to the word. Isaiah 45, verses 7 through 9. I formed light and create darkness. I make well being and create calamity. See that? I make well being and create calamity. I am the Lord who does all these things. Shower, O heavens, from above, and let the clouds rain down righteousness. Let the earth open, that salvation and righteousness may bear fruit. Let the earth cause them both to sprout. I, the Lord, have created it. Woe to him who strives with him who formed him, a pot among earthen pots, does the clay say to him who forms it, what are you making? Or your work has no handles? In other words, God said, God, 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 God said, I create light and I create darkness. God said, I create calamity. I create peace. I, the Lord, he said, I, the Lord, does this. Now, look, look in fact, look at Colossians, uh, not only, now that's Isaiah 45, 7 through 9. Look at Colossians chapter 1, verses 16 through 17. Colossians 1, verses 16 through 17. Colossians 1, verses 16 through 17. For by him, talking about God, all things were created. In heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. This is the sovereignty of God. If, if Listen, my brothers and sisters, as, as we are in Ruth, the first chapter, this is what I want you to know as we come to a close here, a brought close. If it had not been for the famine that drove Naomi's husband to take his family to Moab, her sons marrying two Moab women, her husband and two sons dying, and Ruth insisting and clinging to Naomi on returning with Naomi back to Bethlehem, Jesus, our Savior and Lord, would not have been born in Bethlehem. What are we saying here? What, what are we saying here? Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them who love God and for them who are called according to his purpose. Listen, God loves you, he loves me. And, and, and God already knows that I know where I need to get you. Sometimes I may have to allow certain things to happen in your life for my permissive will to be done in your life. If I called you to the ministry, Amen. And, and, and I want you in the ministry. It's my will for you to be in the ministry. God's going to allow certain things to happen to get you around there. It's like, don't be like me. I ran from it for years. I ran from it. But now when I look back on it, I understand why God allows certain things that happen in my life for me to become pastor of Queen's Chapel. He allowed those things to work together. I didn't understand it at that time. Some of it worked 
Some of it was painful. Some of it was decisions that I had to live with. And some of those decisions I made, I'm still living with it. But yet, God is merciful. God is kind. God could have killed me. God could have ended my life right there in me. But because of his permissive will that I want Pastor Butler, Will Butler, to be pastor of Queen's Chapel, he allowed those things to happen in my life for me to be where I am today. So if you're going through something terrible in your life, we're praying for you. We're, we're praying that God will give you the grace and the mercy to get through it. But God is telling us to trust him. He knows what you're going through. And he knows what his permissive will is for your life. So he wants you to trust him. And he wants you to know that he is there for you. And he's going to work out everything according to his will. Let's pray together. Father, who we thank you, Lord, for this word tonight. Somebody may not fully understand the sovereignty of God's will tonight. Someone, Lord God, want to change their life and change direction. They want to, to, to cling to you, oh God, and they want to leave the old life that they were doing. Father, we pray for them tonight. We pray, oh Lord God, that through, uh, through, your, uh, through your grace, through your pervenient grace, we pray that you will bring them to, to repentance. That, 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 that they will repent of their sins and they will accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And that they will be sanctified, filled with the precious Holy Ghost. And that they will live for you today. Now, Lord, bless us that we shall be blessed and keep us, O oh God, that they shall be kept. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. God bless you. We're going to end this Bible study today. We will be in chapter 2 uh, next week. We want to let you know also that service will be this coming Sunday at 10 a.m. Also, we're inviting you to drive by the church on Sunday. We're going to be giving you your communion. That's right. January is almost over. We're looking at the first Sunday in February, and we can't wait for February because February is going to bring us into our Lenten season. We have an exciting Lenten season for you, so we're asking you to continue in the will of the Lord Jesus Christ. God bless you. We'll see you Sunday. Come by and pick up your communion. May the Lord bless you real good.